Welcome everybody to the um, Cranard Art Museum on the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign campus. Um, we're actually now in the uh, Intermedia Gallery. My name is Hank Kazmarski. I'm the director of the Illinois Simulator Laboratory at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. A lot of what we do as scientists has artistic value too. And so we built this laboratory, this gallery, whatever you want to call it, um, a number of years ago. And um, we're going to talk about a show right now that we have here called Astronomic. In a previous show, we highlighted nature at the most microscopic level. We asked the question of uh, whether MRIs, CAT scans, um, electron microscope images of blood cells can truly be a work of art. Can nature be the first and foremost artist? In this show, we try and highlight nature at the largest scale to ask the question, is nature at the most large scale? Is there artistic value in those images and in, in what nature has created? The idea was to get as many different types of media, painting, sculpture, books from the 1400s that are barely holding together. Media in dimensions even higher than the three dimensions that sculptors work in. And that was the point of this gallery. And I think as you walk through, consider astronomic, the show, to be a metaphor for the kind of art that artists in the 21st century should be able to do. The first piece in the exhibit um, is maybe the, a replica of the first piece ever made um, discussing the Earth as the center of the universe. And the sun is out here on the fourth circle. And then all of the signs of the zodiac um, in Arabic are on this sphere. This is a solid brass sphere, a replica of an actual object that is um, in the Near East. 1350, somewhere between 1350 and 1400. And even this far away in time, um, people in uh, the Muslim countries knew that the earth was round, even though the uh, people in Portugal and um, England weren't so sure about it. But uh, the signs of the zodiac, so astronomy and astrology were sort of one and the same thing back then. We're looking at one of the very earliest uh, printed books that are uh, still left in the, uh, in the world. This is the Liber Chronicarum, the Nuremberg Chronicles, actually, in English. Um, and it basically shows the history of Germany from the creation all the way to uh, 1493. And so, um, of course, when you're starting with creation, you have to start off with Genesis. And the page that it's open to, again, shows the Earth as the center of the universe, as a geocentric galaxy universe. Um, with the sun as the fourth orbiting device around there. So we go from a book that was published in the 1400s to a map that was published in 1568. It's the Earth and then the planets, the, the moon, of course, Mercury, Venus, and then the sun. I mean, that's fairly obvious if you're standing on a stationary Earth. And so now you've got to accept that the Earth is round. Um, but you don't necessarily have to accept that the Earth is somewhere out here, kind of a secondary, sort of a planet sort of thing like everybody else that's out there. And um, if you did try and um, explain this, you pretty much were burned at the stake. This is a very artistic but um, very inaccurate representation of the way things are. Those objects are sort of orthogonal to this very 21st century screen. Each of these little squares, and there are 192 squares, has three LEDs. LEDs were invented on the University of Illinois campus, and this display wall, which used to be a digital dance floor, are driven by the SETI at Home program, the program that captures satellite and um, Earth station information and tries to find extraterrestrial life. So uh, sort of the the joke here is that this search for extraterrestrial life is illuminating these other 1400s and 1500s objects. I don't think if a person stood here for the entire duration of the gallery show, they would see a Martian waving at us or something. It's, this thing is going to be as effective as at finding extraterrestrial life 
as the real computers that are hidden behind there. That is not very. Yes. John Lomberg is a really fun artist. He has um, done work with uh, Carl Sagan uh, for almost all of Carl's major works. Um, and it was one of Carl Sagan's favorite pieces. So this is the connecting piece between the last show that we did about imagining nature, imaging nature at the, uh, at the smallest level and the astronomy level. So here John has put the double helix DNA strand um, floating out in the galaxy, showing the, the connection between nature at the smallest and nature at the largest scale. So it was this piece that was really instrumental in setting the theme for the entire show. Um, John is a living artist in Hawaii. This is an original piece that John has signed just for this show. We're really excited to have it here. So the image behind you is a picture taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's a satellite that is just hanging out in the space of no gravitational pull between the Earth and the Sun. And it's aimed directly at the Sun, and it's just taking pictures of solar flares at various wavelengths. So we gave this image to a uh, stained glass artist, a glass artist that works in um, hot glass, Suzette Hogan. And we said, um, if this were your inspiration for a piece, what would the piece be? And she spent several months during the, uh, the hot summer blowing glass to create um, the piece that's here. It's called Heliostasis. And um, just like the sun is emitting gas and essentially diminishing itself over time, the piece she's created is the sun starting at the um, sort of very inception before all the hydrogen really got bubbling around, uh, moving up to a, to a really nice full bright sun, to a sun that was so bright that it started spitting stuff out just like the image, to a sun that was beginning to sort of decay a little bit, maybe decay a lot, maybe turn into a black hole at the end. It's uh, really about the life of the sun and the life of everything that um, revolves around the sun. Nietzsche said, if you gaze too long into the abyss, the abyss gazes back at you. Uh, that was the inspirational phrase for the artist that did this piece. These are images uh, taken by the Hubble, um, superimposed with um, other images that the artist uh, thought would best uh, work with that phrase. So I'll leave it to the uh, museum visitor to actually figure out what's going on here. But this is a very fascinating piece and um, has attracted quite a bit of attention. We have Chesley Bonisto, who in 1942 was kind of an itinerant artist. And he decided to uh, create paintings of the solar system. So he's got astronauts, teeny little astronauts, landing on Minos, one of the moons of Saturn looking at a, at a Saturn rise. He managed to sell this image to uh, Life magazine for a, a May 29, 1944 issue. This is the actual real issue. It's amazing what you can buy on eBay. They didn't want this to be considered a photograph, so they said that the astronauts are just put in there for scale, that they're not really there. In 1981, Voyager 2 flew close enough to Saturn to take a picture of Saturn that looks remarkably, remarkably like what Chesley Bonestell was imagining uh, 60 years, 50 years earlier. So imaginary image, real image. What we're looking at in the background is the canvas, the Collaborative Advanced Navigation Virtual Art Studio. And it's a 3D space developed um, as a cave, a uh, virtual environment by the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, that was used for visualizing large data sets, but now we're using it to visualize um, everything from four-dimensional perceptual psychology experiment training to uh, what we have here, the universe. These are um, images put together by National Center for Supercomputing Applications um, programmers and um, artists throughout campus to create images that um, 
are fairly representative of what we think is going on in the universe. We didn't doctor the images. We just uh, let people that have an interest in astronomy put uh, 3D data sets, 3D imagery, into this canvas, this cave environment, to have people just sit and look at the universe and maybe appreciate the, uh, the artistry of nature, or maybe just say, yeah, there's a bunch of dots flying around the screen. So the physical structure here is a commercial product called a view station. It's designed to uh, present an image that when you sit up close enough, it um, provides enough information in your peripheral view to where you don't need stereo glasses to be able to get a sense of depth, a sense of immersion in the space. Maybe even a level beyond a plasma screen or an LCD screen, you can actually get up close and look at the, this spiral galaxy, which is one of the objects on the wall. See this spiral galaxy spin around and um, totally cover your peripheral view. When we walk around the gallery, it, it's difficult to say um, what image or what sculpture is artistic and what is scientific. What I tried to select were images that were done by artists, images that were done by machines, um, images that were done by engineers who maybe thought they had an artistic bent to them. As a member of the Beckman Institute, we have an awful lot of researchers that are visualizing nature at the smallest level and at the largest level. So we had a, a tremendous pool of talent to draw from uh, within our own university. The show started August 23rd, and it'll go through at least the end of December, or possibly the second week in January, depending on whether we can keep everything up and running. We hope to be able to take this on the road like we have taken other exhibits on the road. And if we find another museum that is interested in taking the show um, to their studio, that we're more than willing to have it go on the road and, um, and highlight um, the work that the University of Illinois researchers do.